All right, uh, welcome back. In this video, I want to uh, continue talking about the quick sort algorithm. In the last video, we just did a quick introduction to the pivot operation. And now I want to look at the uh, uh, self reduction related to quick sort. So, to do this, let's uh, once again remind ourselves how these self reductions work. Uh, and to do that, I've set up a very simple uh, formula here, S of A. Uh, we can think of this as a function representing the output of our sort problem on input A. Okay, uh, And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this, this simple uh, representation to represent how we can uh, show that the output to the main problem here, that's S of A, can be written uh, with reference to some subproblems. Now here, the subproblems in quick sort are a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more complicated than the ones in merge sort or binary search that we looked at earlier. Uh, in this case, uh, the first thing we did was we performed that pivot operation that that split our all of our elements into three uh, sublists, if you will, or subsets. We have the, all the pivots, uh, maybe only one if we have no duplicates. The left subproblem, which are all the elements smaller than the pivot, and the right subproblem, which are all of the elements that are greater than the pivot. So here, what we're expressing in uh, in our quick sort reduction, if we can perform the pivot operation and then recursively sort the elements in the left subproblem so that they're all in order and then recursively sort all of the elements in the right subproblem so they're all in order and then the pivots are already all in order if there if there are more than one they're all equal to each other otherwise there's only one here and so the plus i have here is indicating just list concatenation here so just take that sorted list uh, concatenate it to the pivot or the set of pivots and then again concatenate it to the, the right subproblem the list that you have here and that will be all of the elements in order Again, trusting in the recursion to make sure that these two subproblems are sorted as well. So this is the sort of the divide and conquer uh, uh, strategy applied to quick sort, allowing us to use the recursion to sort those subproblems. And again, moving from this reduction, the self-reduction uh, to code is is fairly straightforward. Uh, so here I just have a quick example of some pseudocode. Uh, again, here uh, we're going to use the indices of A and B uh, to make sure that we're uh, able to recursively uh, apply this same function to sub sublists. Um, if our A is equal to B, that means our list is of size 1. Uh, we'll just return A. It's already sorted. Otherwise, we'll perform the pivot operation, giving us these three components returned to it, the set of pivots, the left subproblem and the right. Uh, here, uh, our recursive calls now, we carry out uh, the left side and the right side. And then again, just some uh, list concatenation uh, to return. So we have a fairly, uh, fairly straightforward interpretation of our, uh, our reduction here into an algorithm. So I mentioned in, in the last video before presenting the pivot operation that the, uh, the challenge in analyzing quick sort and quick select uh, comes because the size of the subproblems that we recurse on is not always known, or rather it depends on how we select the pivot. Uh, and not really so much on how we select the pivot, although it does depend on that, but on which pivot we select. Uh, we talked about this in the last video. If we select the minimum or the maximum element, element, this would be a bad pivot. It would give us one subproblem of size n minus 1 and another subproblem of size 0. Um, on the other hand, the, maybe the best option for us would be to get a nice pivot right in the middle, like the median element, which would give us a one half. Uh, you know, one, one of our subproblems being about one half or maybe the floor of n over 2. And same thing with the other subproblem about the floor of n over 2. Um, and that would be maybe a good way uh, to split them. Um, and, but in general, on any particular instance when we run the problem, um, or when we run the algorithm, sorry, we're going to select a pivot that uh, we don't know what, it, what two subproblems is going to split it into. It could be any possible division between those two uh, those two extremes. Okay, so again, sort of got this 
uh, highlighted here. If we select the median value, we get lucky. That's our best case. The minimum and maximum are not very good. Um, so which pivot selection method might be better for us given these, uh, you know, given that we now uh, perform this sort of simple or initial analysis? Um, well, the first thing we'll notice is that if we select the first element in the list, which is our standard deterministic algorithm, depending on what our list is when, we've, when we're given it, it's possible that this is a this is uh, either the minimum or maximum. So if you if you give the uh, quicksort algorithm a already sorted list, then that first element will be the minimum or the maximum element. So that would be the worst case. And in fact, the worst case algorithm or the worst case input for the quicksort algorithm is to give it an already sorted list. And I'm going to show us maybe more example of that in a second. On the other hand, though, uh, that doesn't mean that just selecting the first value is always bad. It is, I guess, if the list's already sorted. Um, but if uh, maybe the median element is in the first location, that's the potential uh, for some of the lists that we might be handled, handed, and that would be a perfect selection then. So uh, the outcome of this is that by selecting the first element as our pivot, it's possible we get the worst case pivot, but it's also possible we get the best case pace the best case pivot, and it's also possible that we get any pivot in between the best and the worst case. Uh, so, so really, anything can happen by selecting that method. So what about our second method, selecting a random value? Um, well, the same thing is true then, because now that we're selecting at random, there is a chance that we select the minimum or the maximum, but there's also the chance that we select the median. So uh, this would be, again, equally as good or equally as bad. Uh, in that we might get a, the worst case or the best case in either of these pivot selection methods. The one key distinction between these two pivot selection methods that ultimately uh, lends us to favor one over the other is how uh, is where the where the worst case arises or where it comes from. So in the first scenario, and I mentioned this already, when we select the first element as our pivot then having a list that is already sorted is going to be the worst possible input. Now what that means is that's a bad input for the algorithm. So the run times that are bad when we use that deterministic procedure are run times that are bad because the inputs are bad. We will always have a long run time on those inputs. In the second value, in the second scenario rather, when we select the random value instead of just the first one, what we're doing here is we're taking the, the chance of becoming a worst case out of the input. So we no longer have bad inputs and good inputs, inputs that we'll run fast on and inputs that we'll run slow on. Instead now, the whole, the badness, the chance of getting a bad runtime is now dependent on the random choices we make. And and because of that, all inputs are treated equally now by the randomized algorithm. And so usually we will use the randomized quicksort algorithm over the deterministic algorithm, unless you know we're just using it as a, a way to uh, understand the algorithm in, in more detail. So most times when you see quicksort implemented, it's implemented as the randomized uh, version, uh, not the deterministic version. So, the last method that I presented as at least an option is the idea of selecting the median value as the pivot. And this is actually a challenge uh, because, again, we don't know how to do that uh, in a, sort of a quick way um, that doesn't take too much time, or at least we haven't figured out a way to do that yet. So I'm going to leave this one again as, uh, as just a uh, possibility. Uh, but it's a good possibility because it would always result in the best case. So if only we could find a way to do that. And again, I'll leave that maybe for discussion in a future video. All right, so to sort of complete our analysis here on the quicksort algorithm, uh, what I want to do is again uh, take this to a recurrence relation, see if we can come up with a recurrence relation that captures the runtime for our algorithm. So let's take a look here at maybe our first recurrence relation that we can use to express the runtime of quicksort. Uh, but to do this, we're going to have to split our focus into worst case uh, and best case. So here I'm going to start with worst case. Again, we're going to have some you know, recurrence relation here. Uh, maybe I'm going to say constant time. We know that 
uh, the amount of time taken in, in our base cases, our terminating cases, will always be a constant time, but which values will this be? Uh, let's be careful here. Uh, according to our code over here, if a equals b, that would be if n equals 1. Well, I'm going to say less than or equal to 1. Technically, we'll return an empty list, too, uh, if we were to implement this. So if n is less than or equal to 1, we'll say we take a constant amount of time. So that leaves us with our other possibility if n is greater than 1. Now, what happens in that? Again, taking a look at our code here. Well, I decided I wanted to do the worst case. And remember, we said the worst case is selecting the min or the max as my pivot. If that were the case, we said one of our subproblems is going to be of size n minus 1. The other one is going to be of size 0, which I'm going to assume uh, is, we're not going to recurse on at all. So I'm going to assume we don't do any effort on that one. But we are still carrying out the pivot operation. And remember, the pivot operation we said was going to be theta of n. So I'm going to use d times n to represent that. Now this, this recurrence relation we actually looked at in a previous video. We proved it. We did, it. We did some uh, re repeated substitution on it. And then we proved using induction. And actually, we showed this one here. That's right, theta of n squared. Uh, remember, this was the insertion sort one we had. And so showing here that, that uh, our worst case for our quick sort is n squared. Now, this is, <clears throat> this is important. Okay. Now, uh, why is this important? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we are commonly, we're commonly told and commonly reminded that quicksort is a fast sorting algorithm. And normally, our, our sorting algorithms that we classify as fast have an n log n uh, worst case. So that's like merge. Right. But we've just shown here that our deterministic and actually our randomized version has a worst case runtime of n squared. Okay, that's not good. It's something to keep in mind, and maybe uh, we're, we're going to look at this in a future video to see why we still think of quicksort as an n log n algorithm, despite this worst case worst case runtime as being um, n squared. Now, uh, here's also where maybe you know, if you were uh, Tony Hoare developing quicksort, you might say, well, it feels like it's fast, even though the worst case is bad. Uh, and that might have been one of the reasons why he called it quicksort, is because he wanted us to feel like it had this quick running time. Now, uh, let's let's not you know let's not badmouth Tony Hoare too much about calling him quicksort. Uh, let's take a look at the best case because maybe he's right. Maybe in the best case things aren't that bad. So what was the best case? We said well those two recursive calls we have up there in the best case they're the same size, and there's two of them. And they're both about half the size. Okay. Again, our pivot operation is still going to be dn. And we're still going to have a uh, constant up here for 1. Uh, but now looking at this recurrence relation here, this was our merge sort recurrence relation. And we also had a, uh, a tight bound for this. And we proved this uh, in a previous video. We said that, that recurrent, the, the runtime of that recurrence relation was n log n. So our worst case is n squared, but our best case, that's n log n. Now, normally, we're not too excited when someone tells us our, about our best case operations. Okay. Now, remember, uh, if we were very excited about that, maybe we would like bubble sort then. So bubble sort. Uh, has a worst case of n squared, like quicksort, and it has a best case of n, order n. So wouldn't that be a better sorting procedure, say, than, than uh, quicksort? Well, actually, no. Um, and that's because for quicksort, there's one other case that we haven't considered yet, and that's the average case. And we're not going to look at it in this video, but in a future video, we're going we're gonna to spend some time looking at the average case of quicksort, and we're going to see that indeed the average case is also n log n. And that's what makes us uh, you know, 
more excited about the quicksort operations. So sometimes now, when you're going to see quicksort out there and people are going to say that it's an n log n algorithm, I usually like to put a little asterisk on there to remind me, oh, wait a second, the worst case is actually n squared. But on average, it's n log n. Which means, what does that mean to us in practice? It means when you actually sit down and have to use it in your code and run it, it feels fast. And that's part of the reason why we've called it quicksort, or Tony Hoare called it quicksort, is that even despite this sort of bad worst case runtime, uh, it actually feels fast, and in a lot of cases might actually outperform our merge sort in some cases. So um, uh, again, as I mentioned, more often than not, you're going to find quicksort implemented as your fast uh, uh, sorting algorithm as opposed to merge sort. All right. so. Uh, that's all I wanted to do in this video on quicksort. Um, keeping in mind in a future video I will come back and we will look at the average uh, runtime of quicksort in a lot more detail um, and maybe even prove that correct. Um, so we'll do that in a future video, uh, but thanks for watching uh, and we'll see you in the next video.